Hi there, welcome to Nepian Affairs. It is Saturday, the 2nd of November 2024, which mean, means it is time for another answer and reply video. I have a plethora of your comments and questions to get through, so let's get stuck into it. Going back a few weeks ago to a comment left by ZDS Jamina, most politicians, dictators, and the very wealthy are narcissistic. Now, as soon as I read this, I went, yeah, I agree with this. And then I thought to myself, just because you agree with something, or even if two people agree with something, doesn't mean you're right. We could be completely wrong. Maybe this comment is absolutely 100% wrong. Maybe most politicians, dictators, and very wealthy are not narcissistic. Uh, so one of my strengths is I'm quite curious and open-minded, and I find myself questioning comments, questioning things I've read or heard quite often. So, for instance, I'll just Google this. Just Google this. Uh, and narcissistic is spelled wrong, so let's just click uh, change that. What percentage of leaders are narcissists? I'd say maybe 50% or 18% of CEOs. Okay. Well, but that compared to 5% for the general population. Uh, narcissist CEOs are more likely to hire narcissists to top roles. Yeah. Do leaders have narcissistic traits? I'd say yes, most definitely. Uh, many leaders dominating business today have what psychoanalysis call us uh, narcissistic personality. Now, these aren't peer-reviewed articles. So typically what I like to do is look at peer-reviewed articles, look at the actual proof behind it. Now, I actually do have something interesting in regards to this also. And I do think a lot of people have a problem of simply believing in something they hear first. And a good example of this just happened to me over the last few days. Now, I lived in America, United States, for eight years. So I do like some of the sports over there. So I lived in Oklahoma for a while. So I do support some of the Oklahoma and Oklahoma sporting teams. And there is a game this Saturday. And in this one part podcast, and not only do I listen to investing podcasts, I listen to a whole range of different type of podcasts. So in this one podcast dedicated to this one particular team, they mentioned there was this weather system coming, but by the time the game starts on Saturday, it should have moved through. So I thought, okay, that sounds good. Then the next day I listened to another podcast dedicated to the same team, and they said the complete opposite thing. They said, well, the weather should affect the game. And in fact, uh, actually, I won't say in fact just yet. And so when I heard that, I went, no, no, you're wrong because this other podcast said the weather system should have pulled through. And I caught myself and I went, maybe the first podcaster was wrong and the second podcaster was right. And then another thought hit me, maybe they're both right, because weather forecasts can actually actually change. So I had a look at the source, National Weather Service in the United States, and yes, it does look like this weather system will affect the game. In fact, the university has moved the start time of the game by three hours. So more than likely it won't be affected. So again, that comes back to this idea I did have that when we hear this thought or something for the first time, we tend to believe that and don't question whether it's real or not. Uh, so I think it's very important to question things over and over again. Uh, so uh, even though I do believe that most politicians, dictators, and very wealthy are narcissistic, uh, still have to question it. Now, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, the type of people you want to be in power are the type of people who will never want to be in power. And I think that's an absolute truth. I think of politicians today are the sort of people you don't want to be in power. And those you want to be in power are probably those who don't have as much self-ambition. But if they don't have that self-ambition, they're more likely to do things that are for the benefit of everyone and the country as a whole. But when you do have these narcissistic traits and you do have these power-hungry traits, these self-ambition traits, you're more likely, more likely to do things that are in interest of yourself and not for the country as a whole. Anyway, I'm going to leave that question, that comment uh, there. But I do believe, I think that's probably true, but I will question it. So if you do have differing thoughts, I'd love to hear your beliefs on that. So nothing to do with investing, but it's still interesting. Okay, here's an interesting one. Uh, James uh, loves this Andean silver, the best junior silver stock on the ASX. And then I said, okay, but how many junior silver stocks are there on the ASX? Which is a, no, it's a good question. Not Is there three or four? I don't know. But here's the interesting thing about Andean silver. 
I bought some shares on a Friday. Two reasons why I bought some shares on Friday. The first thing, or the first reason is, let's have a look at silver. So let's have a look at silver prices. So silver did pull back uh, on a Friday or Thursday, and it pulled back to a support level. So I went, ooh, this is interesting. Not only that, I had a look at Andy and silver chart, and I went, this could be a good time to buy some shares in Andy and silver. A nice little pullback to a support zone. So it went, okay, if I did want to take a position in this company, maybe now is a time to do it. More likely a trading position and very small. So I don't have the conviction of James, who believes this is the best junior silver stock on the ASX. What does Andrew Page say? He says, uh, conviction, you can't borrow conviction or something like that. So everyone's going to have different levels of conviction when it comes to company. So I definitely don't have the conviction about this company compared to James. But just based on the chart, I thought, ah, I think now's, I like it. I like, I like the chart. I like this little pullback. And I like where silver prices are. So I've taken a small position in Andean silver, if you can believe that. I don't think you can. Uh, thank you, your Frenchman, for sharing. I, I Apparently, I shared my background. Oh, nine slide glide. I think nine slide glide uh, is quite brilliant. So I think he's very insightful. He always says things that make me think. Uh, maybe not things that make me go, hmm. What was that song, Things That Make You Go? Who ever sung that? Who sung that song, Things That Make You Go? Hmm. Things That Make You Go? Hmm. Who was that? Oh, C&C Music Factory from 1980. Oh, 1990. I was going to say 1989. Okay, things, yeah. Uh, so some of you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, Nine Side Glide said something really insightful here. Further to your point on the current frothy valuation of the ASX, I sort of remember that in the back of my memory, the earnings yield of the All Ordinaries Index being 3.8% is below the Australian government 10-year bond of 4.1%. Therefore, investors are not being compensated for taking added risk for investing in equities. That's absolutely true. That absolute, why would you invest in equities uh, if you're going to get 3.8% return, but you can get a 4.1% return in bonds? whole reason we invest in equities is because we're taking on this extra, extra risk and because we're taking on this extra risk, we expect better returns moving forward. That's the whole point of equity markets. Now, my earnings yield is going to be way higher than 3.8% because I'm not investing uh, for dividends, that sort of thing. But anyway, therefore, investors are not being compensated for taking on the added risk for investing in equities. In fact, investors are having to pay 0.3% for the privilege of taking on that extra risk. That's really Good comment from Nine Slide Glide. I've never thought about that. Did not think about that at all. But it's absolutely true. The whole point of equity or investing in equity markets is you want better returns because you are taking on extra risk. Fantastic comment from the Nine Slide Glide. Uh, just James Dean's talking about capital. Uh, talking about some of the uh, solid first half performance and cash position supports continuing distributions to shareholders. Uh, Capital announced the commencement of another on-market share buyback on or about 23rd of February of up to 10%. Okay, uh, talking about, and no interim dividend declared. My only concern about Capital is it's not a high-quality company. And we have seen this company um, struggle in the past. I still remember it, maybe five or six years ago, there was some problems in regards to, I forget who, Indonesian dumping uh, alumina or aluminium on the market. I forget exactly what happened. And you can see this company back uh, in the start of 2000 and, or the 2000s, the share price was in a massive downtrend. Look at that. Not sure if the same company, not sure. Uh, but then share price has gone sideways for a long time. Now, if you do look at the weekly chart here, I don't mind this weekly chart. It has moved into an uptrend. Share price has moved from about 250 up to about $10. So over the past four yeah, four years or so, almost five years now, uh, the share price has moved up. So nothing to really complain about when it comes to the chart. But my only concerns about Capital, not a high quality company, and I don't think they control their destiny, just like a lot of other mining companies out there. They don't control their destiny completely. Uh, maybe a little bit, but not completely. They're still slaves, if I can use that word, to the underlying commodity they are mining. Well, Capital's not mining, but they're still slaves to, is it aluminium they do? 
They do stuff with aluminium, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, get manufacturing, marketing, and distribution of fabricated and semi-fabricated aluminium. So if you don't know, it says it's spelt aluminium here. Yeah. If you don't know what happened to this company back about five years ago with aluminium, Indonesia or China, something happened, I forget what. Anyway, that's Capral. Landy Lee says, what are your thoughts on a BCI? Looks like it wants to break above resistance level at 31 cents. So BCI used to be called something else, I believe. I still remember it's an iron ore, has something to do with iron ore. It used to be called something else. Uh, BC Iron? Yeah, BC Iron Limited. Uh, so I'm not sure if they've changed their business model. Mentions here they are developing a salt and potash business supported by iron ore royalty earnings. Just shows you I haven't had a look at this company um, for a while because salt and potash or potash, and they've got royalty earnings, which makes this company interesting. Now, one of the reasons why this company popped, um to, uh, popped onto my radar is the chart, just like Landy Lee said. Uh, looks like it wants to break out a break above resist level at 31 cents. So let's have a look at the chart for BC Minerals. Uh, this one definitely entered my radar uh, because I put this purple box there. I'm not sure when I put it there, but that's a nice little resistance zone. And yeah, if it gets above, say, 31, 32 cents or above this purple box, it's all systems go for BC Minerals. So I have to agree with Landy Lee. Uh, looks promising. I can't confirm right now that it is breaking out, but it's on the verge of breaking out. The other thing I've noticed here is a big increase in volume in 2024 compared to 2023. That could be a good sign uh, that there are some fund managers taking position in this company. And maybe that's one of the reasons why the share price looks like, look like it's going to go higher. So I don't know much about the company, but just the chart. The chart looks interesting. Now, I'm going to have a look at the weekly chart. I like having a look at different time frames. And not surprising, back in 2014 to 2016, the share price of this company fell like a rock. So that was a really bad period for a lot of iron ore companies. Share price of this company fell from 440 down to like 20 cents. Uh, other companies like Atlas Iron no longer with us. Uh, even if you look at uh, BHP, uh, back in 2016, I think it was the start of 2016, the share price of BHP reached its long-term low. Uh, iron ore had a long-term low at the start of 2016. So even iron ore is cyclical. You have to understand that. Anyway, so BC Minerals may be a bit of a different company now, not only focused on iron ore. Uh, anyway, and even though you can see the weekly chart starting to look possibly interesting. Okay, Fishball says, do I do my own taxes? Absolutely. Do get help from some of the uh, sites. Like Sh Superhero does a really good job uh, with uh, helping you out doing your taxes. Uh, not as much better than Self Wealth. I actually had to do my own calculations with Self Wealth, but Superhero had it all for me. Every like capital gains, uh, they do the whole less than 12 years, 12 months, rather than 12 months, capital gains for each. Capital losses, capital gains, that sort of thing. It really helped when I did my taxes this year or last year. Um, anyway, any tips when you buy and sell so much shares and have some in super? It's a random question, but I think it's everyone can benefit from. Okay, so super, I don't care about super because it's super. Uh, so as I mentioned there, Superhero did a really, really good job. I'm really impressed with what Superhero did. Uh, with my self-wealth, I had to do everything myself. I had to do a spreadsheet, uh, use self uh, share site as well. But I was actually thinking because of what Superhero does, I don't need to do or use self uh, share site. The only problem I had with uh, Superhero is uh, that dividend information isn't digested into the taxes. My dividends through Self Wealth were, so I just did a whole. Now, they did a total of all my dividends how much of franking, unfranked, and all that sort of thing. So I put one number in my taxes. Now, I think they want all dividends, so every single dividend you do receive, but I, I just put a lump sum. Hopefully, that's okay. Uh, hopefully, that answers your question. Yeah. I used to do spreadsheets, but I don't have to do spreadsheets anymore because ShareSite and now Superheroes does most of the work for me. Anmar 133, super curious regarding Star Entertainment Group and Finbar. Thoughts on them? 
Start Entertainment Group. We'll just do charts. So, oh, yeah. Start Entertainment Group, risk. So this is an instance where I think this is speculative, it's completely speculative. There is, without doubt, a future. You know, the future is not written. In fact, because the future has not happened yet, maybe it has. I don't, don't know. Maybe there is, I, I don't know, maybe we, we don't understand time enough. Maybe the future has already been written. But because the future hasn't been written, there are def, there are many, a multitude of different futures possible. And when I say multiple, I'm saying infinite amount of futures possible. And in quite a few of those future possible future possible outcomes, Star Entertainment Group does not make it. It uh, goes bankrupt, that sort of thing. Uh, so there is a lot of risk. Uh, there is a lot of risk right now with Star Entertainment Group. Uh, so you do want to have a really good reward if it pays off. And I do think right now at say twenty two cents. If the company can turn things around, and there's a big if there, if they can turn things around, the share price could, I wouldn't say 10 back from here, but I could see it happening. I could see Star Entertainment Group in, say, five to 10 years being a 10 bagger from here, but there is risk. So the question I think everyone has to ask themselves, am I willing to take on the risk that this company could go bye-bye without doubt? Not without doubt. That's no, there is a possible uh, history, future history where this company does not succeed, does not, um, is no longer in, is no longer, what's the word? There is a future history where this company is no longer on the ISX because it's gone bye bye. Yeah, anyway. And the other one was Finbar. I don't know much about Finbar. I think it's Finbar or Fin Resources. Is that right? Fin Resources. I was, what's Finbar? Oh, I think Finbar is FBR. No, Finbar is, no, FBR is FBR. What's Finbar? Finbar is our fry, fry. I know absolutely nothing about Fin resources. I can't even tell you what this company does. The first thing I'll say is the share price is below one cent. So I have no interest in any companies whose share price is below one cent because this is where you get the pip traders. All they care about is the share price going up and down by one point, by 0.1 cent. So the share price dropped 14% because it went down by 0.1 cent. Not 1 cent, 0.1 cent. If it drops uh, from 0.5 cents to 0.4 cents, that's a 20% drop just because maybe one person sold out, out some shares. Now, share price could go on a run, but it's less likely to go on a run because pip traders. So what, what, you, what you'll see happening is some pip traders will buy at 0.6 cents and then merely put the shares in the sell column at 0.7 cents just to get that pip trade. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I don't trade or un, uh, or, and, um, or am unwilling to hold companies whose share price is below 0.1 cents. So therefore, I have no really opinions about that company, Fin Resources. Thank you, Sensei. Sensei asked, oh, this is a philosophical question, a deep philosophical question. Legit question and not trolling. Nepi, in your opinion, what happens to humans after they die on planet Earth? Now, I've already mentioned in this video, I tend to be fairly open-minded, curious. So I have left everything on the table. I have no belief uh, because I think having, because nothing's come to me. No one said this is definitely what's going to happen when you die. No one knows. Honestly, no one knows. No one can say to me, 100%, this is what's going to happen to you when you die. If someone said that to me, I was saying, well, you might believe that, but is that absolutely true? There is a possibility. We're living in a simulation. I mean, the theory behind we're living in a simulation is actually really reasonable. I'm not sure. Elon Musk says he's 100% sure we're living in a simulation. I'm not sure if he's being absolutely honest when he says that. Simulation. Uh, there's a one in billion chance that this is base reality. In other words, Musk believes that we are almost certainly living in a computer simulation. And the logic behind it is actually really sound. It's really sound logic. Uh, the way you look at this is there's one real universe. And in this one real universe, because just think of humans, we love to simulate. We love to simulate everything. So in this one real universe, uh, there's going to be intelligent life uh, life uh, beings out there, or beings out there, 
who just simulate everything. Maybe humanity is in living in year 3,500 and they're simulating the past. And this could be one of those simulations. So the amount of possible simulations that exist is in the billions and billions. So what's the likelihood that this is the one real universe, the non-simulated universe? It's very low. That's what he's talking about. So there is a possibility we're living in a simulation. Uh, and if that's the case, possibly our God is this 41-year-old living in his mother's basement who's just developed this simulation of our world just to see what happens if Trump did become president. That's a possibility. So you've got to leave everything open. I've got to leave everything up in the air because no one has ever said anything to me that makes me think, yes, what you believe, uh, what happens to us after we die is legit. So I have no beliefs about what happens to us after we die. It could be anything from nothing, absolutely nothing, to yes, we're living in a simulation and we just, and, well, what happens? What happens when we die in a simulation? No idea. Maybe, who knows? Well, I suppose in that case, nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Thomas Heidelberg says, IPB looking smoke. By the way, before I get to, I'm not religious or anything. And the whole reason I'm not religious is because I'm really open-minded. And I think every single religion that's ever existed could be right. Could be right. And the likelihood of any single religion being right is actually fairly low. Yeah, that's right. Fairly low. Anyhow. Thomas Heidelberg says, IPB looking smoky. Read between the lines. There could be a monster. Well, I'm pretty sure you mean monster in a good thing, not a bad thing, because if it's a really nasty thing, then uh, everyone, everyone will be running for the hills uh, to save themselves. IPB, is this an oil company? I have, again, in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking oil. Something petroleum. There is IPB petroleum. Yeah, there we go. I don't know why. Again, this share price of this company is below one cent, so I am not going to pay any attention to this company because the share price is below one cent, and you can see nothing's really happened. So this is definitely a company where I would just look at the chart and go, I'll just move on to the next one. Now, the other thing I should actually just check is whether this company has any revenue, any cash receipts. Is this in company in production? Let's have a look at the most recent Appendix 5B. Do they have any cash flow? Is there anything happening with this company? And the answer to that is no. In fact, they don't spend a lot of money. Spent $110,000 in operations, $12,000 in exploration and evaluation. This is a very small company. Uh, cash has decreased a little bit. Markup of this company must be really low. Mark up is $4 million. Uh, anyway, so you might believe this is a monster or has uh, the potential to be a monster, but at this point in time, because just because of the share price, I would stand back. Now, now, you could have your own separate, different rules, but one of my rules is to stay away from companies whose share price is below one cent. So this could be a monster in the future, but because of that one rule I do have, I am away or standing away uh, from this company. Anyway. Uh, other than that, I have no idea about IPB, petroleum. Column, is that how you say that in names? Irish, Column, Doherty. Hey, Neppy, like your insights. I've just sold Acadium but reluctantly for a small profit. I didn't know what would happen to my investment after the Rio deal went through. I panicked. What would be, would have happened to my shares? Would I just get a payout from Rio? I'm looking for the next junior lithium play. What do you think about Patriot? Now, it depends on what this deal with Rio. Uh, maybe you'll get some Rio shares or maybe they'll give you just, just some money or maybe it's a combination, maybe some shares and some money. So have a look. They should actually mention how they're going to do it. So what's Arcadian? Okay, got to spell it right. Okay, uh, oh, this one. Whoops. Arcadian. I am just... Arcadian. I'm just going to go LTN. That's right. So in some one of the announcements, here's the 9th of October, uh, they should mention how they're going to proceed with this takeover. Are you going to receive just script or scripted money or just money? So here we go. Uh, Rio Tinto will acquire Arcadian in an all-cash transaction 
for $5.85 US per share. Uh, so there it is, all cash transaction, which says to me you'll receive cash and no script. That's your question to your first bit. Uh, your second question, Patriot. So let's have a look at the chart for Patriot. See if this or the share price of this company is below one cent. No, that's actually well below. I mean, well above, sorry. Not well below, well above. 37 and a half cents. But the first thing that I know when looking at this chart is it's in a downtrend. So I know nothing about Patriot Metals. I'm not sure. I doubt they're in production. PTM? No, that's the wrong one. That's Platinum Asset Management. PMT. Uh, where are they in regards to development, um, exploration? Where's their projects? Looks like that's, is that Canada? That name looks Canadian. I could be completely wrong. Maybe it's like, uh, it looks like uh, Eskimo sort of word. That's probably the wrong word. That word just looks Eskimo-ish. Such key 101. Quebec, yeah, okay. Uh, so native native Canadian, maybe that's the best word. Okay, uh, and Quebec seems to be a lithium hotspot, doesn't it? Anyhow, um, you probably know way more about Patriot Metals than I do. Put it that way. Uh, and what I do with these sort of companies, I'm not even sure if this company is in my lithium watch list. It's not. So I'm going to put this in, um, into my lithium watch list. Uh, and the first thing I would do is just have a look at the chart. Share price could fall much further from here. Maybe it's already reached the bottom. I just don't know. All I'm doing is looking at the chart, and it's still in a down trend. So that's what I'm going to talk about when it comes to Patriot battery, battery metals. You probably know way more than I do. Uh, and, again, there's like over 2,000 companies on the ASX. There's no way, there's no way we are going to know all of them. And, obviously, you have a plan. Seems like you have a plan. You like the lithium space. You've moved. It looks like maybe you've had success with uh, junior lithium companies in the past. I do know some people who have had successful past doing that. Uh, in fact, I know some people who have become, I wouldn't say filthy rich, but have uh, done really well by buying junior lithium companies over the past 10 years. <sighs> Hope you made some today. Talking about ProMedicus, made some what? I don't know. Uh, just James Dean, XGO is predominantly banks, mining, CSL, West Farmers, don't, doesn't warrant such a high PE. We are ripe for pullback. Can't disagree with that, to be honest. I, and to be honest with you, apart from CSL, maybe West Farmers, I would never own banks and mining companies for the long term. In, in my opinion, they are more trading stocks. You just buy and hold them when, you know, sentiment's really good, going through uptrends, or when they're filthy rich or filthy cheap. Uh, CSL is definitely a long-term hold, I believe. But even when, even though it's a long-term hold, you will see periods where price does nothing. And we've seen that with CSL over the past four years. But eventually, because it's still growing and it's growing at a nice clip, eventually we're going to see price take off again. And it could take off, go an uptrend for like four or five years and then go in sideways for another four or five years. And I, I do agree that uh, when you compare the Australian market to the American markets, there's no comparison. I would much rather, much rather invest in the American companies because they are growth. They are fu the future. Mining and banks are not the future. Well, in a way, mining companies are the future, but they're not necessarily good investments. Put it that way. They're not good investments. That's just my opinion. Okay, Lazy Eye says you spoke about platinum. Talking about platinum asset management, we had Patriot Minerals, PMT. Now we're talking about Platinum Asset Management, PTM. Anyway, I spoke about this company a few weeks back when it was 94 cents. I bought 5,000 worth it sold at 115. It made just under 1,000. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, I'm going to have a look at, you did better than I. I didn't even think about buying Platinum Asset Management. Now, this company did come on my radar, just the chart, the other day because it looks like it's starting to turn upwards. Yeah, it looks pretty good. This is actually the first time this chart has looked good for a long time. And I think one of the reasons behind this, there is a Toko bid for the company, I believe. But I did have a look at their recent quarterly update or monthly update. When was it? Here it is, Funds Under Management and Business Update. It actually sounded positive. I was like, this actually sounds pretty good. 
well, pretty good, relative speaking, for this company. So investment performance turned strongly positive in September across a range of investment strategies. Positive investment performance drove funds under management higher over the month in September to $12.5 billion. So I read this and went, this is the first time I've ever seen positiveness coming out of this company. And lo and behold, the chart is starting to look positive, and lo and behold, there's a takeover bid from Regal Partners. So this is the first time I've looked at this chart for a long time and went, ooh, it's looking pretty good. Looking pretty good. It's good enough for me to actually write it down. I keep forgetting to write it down. And I'm going to do it later. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. But congratulations, lazy eyes. By the way, I'm not an uh, advisor. Just because I say something doesn't mean you have to act upon that. Do your own research. And I'm sure lazy eyes did their own research. A U no A Y U 5657, interesting take on smart parking. Haven't thought of that. How about car, car group? You reckon there will be Ozempic-like narrative driven to it? Less cars ownership, hence less listings. Now, I'm going to say, I remember what I was talking about here. I think in the future, I see a future where people don't own their own cars. I see a future when people don't even drive. Now, I will say this. I'm usually way too early to with a narrative, way too early. So my narrative more than likely won't happen for the next 20, 30, maybe even longer than that. So I wouldn't be concerned about what I have to say because I'm usually way too early to narrative. So uh, I wouldn't be concerned about smart parking or even car group at this point in time. But things are moving in that direction. I think there's no doubt about that. Things are moving in that direction. And I'll tell you this much. Governments around the world will save a lot of money if humans aren't allowed to drive because most accidents are caused by human error. Shelley Dugmore, glad to hear you're more positive on demerics. Yeah, I'm positive demerics, but I did sell out. Uh, what's going on with Neurom Pharmaceuticals, which I did not sell out. So I'm going to look at both the charts for both of these companies. So demerics is more of a story stock. There's still a bit of uncertainty about this company. So I am training it, and I did get a sell signal. And then I was thinking of buying back in because the downtrend came to an end and we have seen a pretty good pullback. So there is a chance I might buy back in at a lower price than I sold. Uh, but I don't like this chart as much as I did from when it broke out last October all the way through to about July. Now, the reason why I became less bullish in July is you can see a share price went on a really good run. Went up to 65 cents in June then pull back, but the next high was actually lower. That's the first negative sign. And then, in fact, the share price moved into a short-term downtrend. Fell to about $0.35, cents, and I think possibly we are seeing at least the share price moving sideways, if not possibly moving into a new uptrend. But still, there's a bit of uncertainty about this company. It's still a bit of a story stock, uh, unlike New York Pharmaceuticals, who are, is or are receiving a lot of money because they do have a product that is being sold, not by them, but by another company called Acadia or KDM, something like that. Anyway, Acadia. Uh, I don't know what's happening here. So share price in the downtrend. So this is a case where maybe I should be trading this. So if I was trading this, I would have sold back in August. There was a really negative day here. So I could have sold that day or the next day for about $17, and now the share price is $12.25. So this is further proof that actually using charts can actually help in the long run. Now, the problem with that is, and my, th my thought was, well, maybe that's going to be the low and the share price just pops up. And I was thinking, well, if that does happen, I'll just buy back in. If the share price gets back into this purple box, just buy back in. So that was my sell signal. If the share price falls below this purple box, sell. And I just thought to myself, oh, do I want to take on that risk? And I'm thinking now to myself, yeah, why not? Because the share price has fallen a fair bit. And the share price just bounced back into the purple box, just, you know, buy back in. Anyway, uh, I've made a lot of money with Neuron Pharmaceuticals. I've taken profits. Uh, so, yeah, the chart looks pretty negative. And I think it was just concerns about how their day, how the debut was selling and maybe it was less popular than expected. That's the only thing I can think of. Uh, and this could be just short-term negative sentiment. And then maybe in a year's time, we're going to see the share price much higher. It could double in a year's time. And that's just because of sentiment. Maybe that's all that's driven the share price down. It's just negative sentiment, short-term negative sentiment. And charters, maybe charters, technical analysis. 
Uh, Kai, Health7085. Hi, Nippy. Just wondering what platform do you use to trade shares in your super? And if so, do the same rules apply when trading shares in your super around capital gains discount if holding for more than a year at tax time? So are you use net wealth and all rules in regards to capital gains, they do everything for me. Everything. So I just buy and sell shares and they do everything else. Uh, so that's net wealth. I forget what it's called. Um, what was it called? Net wealth. I used to be, I used to be um, Australian super. Forget what that was called. Called. It's not SMSF. It's oh, what's it called when you do yourself DIY super? I forget what it's called. That's a, it's super accelerated plus. A cost effective way, easy way to manage your super, which gives you the option to invest in turn deposits. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. So here it is. Yeah. So this is the Super Accelerated Plus, uh, ASX listed securities, international securities. Uh, that's the only two things I really care about. I don't care about managed account models, wholesale managed funds, term, term deposits, investor rewards. I wanted access to oh, international equities. Uh, the other thing I wanted access is to every single company on the ASX. This allows me that. Australian Super, I think it was called Members Direct. They did not allow me every single company on the ASX. It was only the, the ASX 300, the odds, I believe. So I've been with NetWell for about five years or so, and they do all the capital gains, and they just do it themselves. So I don't have to worry about I don't have, don't have to worry anything about that. So there you go, Health 705, 7085. Okay, what's up with the names? Q2211Z7U. What about you give the 11 factories money back? Uh, so talking about Mosaic Brands, what about you give the 11 factories money back, which approximately $86 million, why not give these back? How cheap you people are, laugh out, laugh out loud, captivating all the money. Okay. Okay, yes. Well, Mosaic Brands into administration, if you don't know. And I'm not sure what they're talking about here. Anyway, yeah, so they gone into administration, so who knows? I did actually read something today about Mosaic Brands. A few people are pretty sad that they won't be go, might not be able to go into river stores, and then there was analysis saying no one's going to miss any of their stores. They won't be missed at all. And unfortunately, they weren't able to move with the times. And that is a thing with a lot of companies. They aren't able to adjust, adapt to the changing times. We saw that with some of the biggest companies in the past, Xerox, Xerox, Kodak. Although Kodak did have uh, digital camera uh, technology, but they just refused to adopt it. Not adopt it, but um, use it. Anyway, Just James Dean says, Dalrymple Bay Infrastructure at 22 PE for slow growth infrastructure play. We are in the bubble. So just James Dean do does think we're going to have a pullback. Uh, and, yeah, infrastructure play at 22 PE. Yes, I would agree with that. In fact, there's quite a few companies on the ASX I think are significantly overvalued. Banks, uh, if that is right, 22 PE for this company. The chart looks pretty good. We'll have to give that. The chart does look good. And versus or via training view, uh, yeah, the P ratio is like 22, which is ridiculously high for a company like this. Uh, Woolworths, still the valuation of Woolworths is ridiculously high. Uh, so in many ways, I agree with just James Dean, but we can remain in a bubble for a long time. Uh, in fact, we can remain permanently, no, maybe not permanently in a bubble, but uh, just because we are in a bubble doesn't mean it's going to pop tomorrow. Might pop next year, may never pop. And again, I don't, you know, that, that's not likely. <sighs> Just Jeans, a Terminator robot will be much, far more valuable and profitable than a babysitting robot. Tesla needs new best. Oh, I don't know if I agree with that. I reckon if I had a robot who could do all my chores, all my washing, my cooking, the mowing, if a robot could do all that for me, I would buy one, depending on the price depending on the price. And I do think eventually this is going to happen as well. Not sure when, 
But I would not be surprised if this sort of thing happens in the future where everyone has this little robot who does all the work. In fact, so I have a lot of repair people coming over just to fix things in the house that we're going to sell. And I was just thinking the other day, eventually a robot's going to be doing this because it's going to be way cheaper, way, way cheaper. Uh, anyway, Ben Hutchinson, hi, Nepi. Haven't watched today's yet, so apologies if you discuss, but did you notice the 8% move in DGL on no news? Fifth consecutive up day seems to have bounced off some support, but more work and likely time needed to break its massive down trend. So something is definitely moving with DGL. I think that's absolutely true right now. Uh, DGL is charts looking, starting to look really interesting. Uh, so yeah, five days up in a row. This was back in early October. Share price during that little run got up to fifty, was it fifty four cents? There was a little pullback. Now it's up to sixty and a half cents. Uh, this chart is definitely look better. The other thing is we've seen some big volume, not big volume, but some high volume coming in. I do like the beginnings here of this chart. However, however, this reminds me of back in February. You can see back in February, share price started to go on a run, and I was getting a little bit excited back here. I was like, I was like ooh, this is getting exciting. And then they released negative results in February, and share price dipped. Uh, so that does look not identical, but it does look similar. And as they say, history doesn't repeat, but it often does rhyme. Is this an instance where that is true? Uh, but this chart is looking interesting. And to be honest with you, I think this company is cheap. Cheap. Dev Shah. What are your thoughts on PBPM minerals? I have zero thoughts on BPM. What do they mine? If, they probably don't mine anything. They're probably an explorer. First thing I do is look at the chart. Is a share price above one cent? Well, it is. It's at 7.1 cents. Looks like something really exciting happened on the 18th of September. Share price rallied 72% then, went to high on that day of 14.5 cents. Share price has halved since that high. In fact, over the last few weeks, the share price has dropped a fair bit from about 12 cents down to 7.1 cents. In fact, it's falling towards where it started, which was uh, around 5 cents. Big volume has come through the last, or since that announcement. Uh, so it's really interesting the share price has dropped. And there was one big down day. That was on the 22nd of October. Share price dropped 29%. Other than that, I know nothing about this company. BPM Minerals, share price up 9% though. Oh, they released further assay results on the 22nd. Was that the big down day? I forget. Yep, yep. So the market didn't like these assay results at the Louis Gold Discovery. So obviously they're a gold exploring company. I would say they're an exploring company, not a company in production. Let me confirm that. Yep, in production. Now, that's it. I have no thoughts about this company. I'm not an expert in geology, not an expert in reading uh, drilling results, that sort of thing. And I do try to stay away as much as possible from mining, exploring companies, just because, you know, there's up that whole saying, just stay in your confidence circle, what they call it, circle of confidence. And when I talk about my circle of confidence, it's most companies except mining, exploring companies. That's not absolutely true. But I do find mining, exploring companies the hardest, the hardest to analyze. And so I do try to stay away from it because I have no idea. Share price could go significantly higher or significantly lower. And the other reason I'm not a big fan of these companies is because they don't generate any money. Uh, they have zero cash generation. So a lot of the success of this company moving forward has to do with their drilling results and who knows what's going to happen with their drilling results moving forward. And I can also tell you there are much smarter people in the market than me who are looking at this company and I just look at the chart and the chart tells me what they think about this company right now. And at this point in time, they're a little bit unsure. Definitely not positive, but a little bit unsure, particularly with that announcement on the 22nd of October. Anyway. And I, I can almost get guarantee you know way more about this company than I do. Uh, Just James Dean says, oh, God, don't buy a unit. Strata is nothing but headaches. I understand that, but there are actually some benefits of buying a unit. There's also a lot of negatives, some positives about buying a house, some negatives, 
And that's what I'm weighing up. And the strata bit about units is the biggest or the corporate body. That by far is the biggest uh, the biggest um, bad thing about the units. But some of the positives I do sort of like, but I don't know. I sort of am leaning towards uh, buying a house in a bad suburb. I did that last time and it's done wonderfully well for me. And the suburb we're in now has been gentrified and that's what I think is going to happen in Brisbane, uh, in some other suburbs in Brisbane over the next 10 years or so, uh, particularly before the Olympics. And so I am looking at some of the worst suburbs and you can actually buy some houses for like $600,000, $700,000, which I'm willing to do. Anyway, but one of the reasons I don't mind a unit is there are some things to like about living close to CBD and everything's in walking distance. I actually do like that. Also, a smaller area, I do like that as well. I don't need a big area. All I need is like one or two bedrooms. That's all I need. I'm not a, I'm not a person of needs, big person of needs. I don't need big places. Just James Dean says, first time investors in China return from national holiday, play out life savings, money from mortgage, money from loan sharks into the stock market one day before the bubble. Oh, ouch. Like, I'm not going to comment on that uh, in, because the, Shang, the Shanghai has been just, just been going bananas. In fact, where is it? I have to look at. Video. T- I've got the Hang Seng somewhere here. Here it is. HSI. I actually don't mind the Hang Seng here. Just by looking at this very quickly, we had this really big run up, and then it pulled back, and it's been going sideways for the last two weeks. Uh, if I saw, if this was an individual company's chart, I'd like be like, ooh, nice little pullback, and it's found a bit of support, a bit of consolidation. It's looking pretty good. Anyway. That's all I'm going to mention when it comes to China and the Hang Seng. 100% returns. If people like Eagers got to love Peter Warren Automotive cheaper, their property in Sydney could be sold for thousands of apartments on them and cover the market. Great run of business shares don't get printed by directors. And Sensei says, what made PWR jump from $0.03 cents to 339 in May 2021? I'm not sure that happened. Let's... Let's see if this actually happened for PWR. I do know some people are paying attention to Eagers. Uh, the chart is meh, but there's a chance the share price has reached the bottom. Now, when it comes to some of the financials, now I'm getting a bit um, simplistic here. Uh, P ratio of Eagers is 11, dividend yield of 6.66. So let's have a look at Peter Warren, PWR, who stole PWH Holdings. Ticket code. No, PWR holdings ticket code. Um, share price in the downtrend. Sort of similar than Eagers, but P ratio 8.29, dividend yield 8.4%. Now, I'm not sure the difference between the two companies. I haven't delved that too deeply into them, but 100% return seems to like or prefer Peter Warren. So maybe 100% returns has delved a little bit deeper in both the companies. Yeah, that's what you should do delve deeper if that's your sort of thing. Now, let's have a look at Sensei. Um, uh, $0.03 cents to 3.39 in May 2021. Is that true? I don't think that's true. And the reason I say that's not true is because I'm pretty sure Peter Warren listed in 2021. Let's have a look when Peter Warren listed. So all I do is go to Market Index and go straight to the end. Uh, they listed, it looks like, in April 2021. So, yeah, May 2021. Oh, it definitely did not go from $0.03 cents to, yeah, the share price was, yeah, there was no big jump. So I have no idea what you're talking about, Sensei. No idea. Neil Wesson. Uh, can you compare Tasmania's true weather with some place very close in terms of weather, uh, Waikato or maybe Christchurch? I see what you say if you understand. Tasmania's true weather. 
I would say the western parts of Tasmania are fairly wet. Um, on the northern or the western side of New Zealand, they have ranges, so there could be some rain shadows. Uh, fairly mountainous both, you would say. Yeah, I'm not a big expert on uh, Tasmanian weather or even New Zealand weather. I'm not sure if I can if I am able to answer your question to um, your satisfaction. Yes, uh, and I'm not even sure what this is in relation to. I'll be honest with you. Thank you, Anderson. Congrats, Nepi, for correctly picking the Celtics and Lions. Did I really? I have no idea. I'll get back to my 2024 predictions, and if I did predict these two, these two companies, these two competitions right, just luck. Uh, Sensei, Nepi, the hardest working New South Welshman on YouTube. She Percy then says, I am from Queensland. And Justine says he's from the best country and it's Australia. Okay. So there's a lot of right comments here. Every single comment here is actually technically right. So Sensei, I would consider myself to be New South Welshman. Yes, I would. I grew up in New South Wales. Uh, I lived. I'm going to say now, I've lived 20, 23 years of my life, less than half of my life in New South Wales, and the other half overseas or in Queensland. I'll put it that way. So half my life in New South Wales, the other half in uh, overseas, eight years, and the rest in Queensland. I've been a Queenslander for, well, I've lived in Queensland. I have not been a Queenslander. I've lived in Queensland for 17 years, and I would never consider myself to be a Queenslander. There is zero way I'll ever consider myself to be a Queenslander because I come from New South Wales, and I think it just doesn't happen. I don't know. It's just Maybe it's just me. Uh, I could live here for the rest of my life in Queensland, and I'm happy living in Queensland. I like Brisbane. I like southeast Queensland. I think it's a great place to be. Uh, I prefer it overseas, although, to be honest with you, I lived in Coogee in Sydney. Great place. I've lived in Melbourne for one year. I don't miss it. The only thing I miss about Sydney is where I lived, which was near the beach. And you don't get that in Melbourne or Brisbane. Uh, you don't get, I loved beaches. I love living near beaches. Uh, so I can't get that in Brisbane. But where I live in Brisbane right now, it's fantastic. It's a brilliant place, northwest uh, Brisbane, uh, really near nature, mountains, that sort of thing nearby. You can't get that in uh, Sydney or Melbourne, um, but I will be moving. Not sure where yet. Uh, and I am from the best country, USA, USA. Okay, so I'm half American, half Australia. So technically I have dual citizenship uh, and um, in a way I have the best of both worlds. Uh, anyway, and the reason I say that is when I go to Canada, I just when I come back from Canada, I just flash in my um, US uh, passport straight through. Uh, it's really weird because I have travelled with um, people from Australia before, going from Canada to USA. They get grilled, and they respect me. Those uh, what do you call them? These those people at the border. Uh, Welcome back to uh, United States, sir. Where are you going? And all that sort of crap to uh, my passengers. Yes, yes, they grill my passengers. But for me, really respectful um, and get the best of both worlds. Anyway, and the reason I have American citizenship is because my dad, American Army, uh, my parents lived in the United States for a long time, maybe not a long time, for a while. Both my sisters were born in the United States and they moved to Australia because they wanted their children brought up in a better country and they made the right decision. I Living in the United States for eight years, there are things I really like about the United States. There are some things I like about the United States over Australia, but living in Australia is much better than living in the United States. Um, and the things I like about the United States, I love the sporting culture there. Uh, I love the fact that every single night there's some sport on. I love the uh, the, the weather over there. Just The weather is just so much more fascinating. Uh, what else? And I love the mountains. I'm a massive mountain person. My favourite place in the world is West United States, uh, so Rockies and West. Uh, so Rockies, uh, the Cascades, Sierra Nevadas, uh, also include Canada in that. I love mountains. So when I go on my uh, trip to America next year, I'm going to go on a hiking holiday. So I'm going to do massive amount of hikes all over the places, uh, hikes I've never done. Uh, some hikes I've done before, but um, 
that's the thing I really prefer in America over Australia, the weather, sporting culture, and the mountains. If we had that in Australia, particularly the mountains, I would love it here. You say, well, we have some mountains in Australia. No, it does not compare. And I love snow too. <clears throat> Anmar, JP Morgan sold a lot of uh, Star Entertainment Group thoughts. Good stock to buy at a discount. So, well, I've talked a lot about Star Entertainment Group. Um, I've already mentioned, yeah, it's a bit of a risk right now. Yeah. Solcar SC7WF, have you en- ever invested in IPO? It's an easy question to answer. If yes, can you share on how one can go with investing in IPO? Well, I don't have to read anything more because I've never invested in an IPO and I'll never invest in an IPO. Never, ever, 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 ever. In fact, I have a rule that I don't invest in a company that has recently listed on the ASX unless they've either released results, so we're talking about six months, or they release a positive trading update. And the reason behind that is I've seen time and time again the share price of companies who list on the ASX drop. I'd say 90% of times share price drops. Uh, and if the company releases a positive trading update, share price will go on a run. So that has been a really successful strategy I've used in the past. Recent IPO, positive trading update, profit upgrade, share price goes on a run. IP D Group, Dusk Group back in late 2020. Both companies released a positive training update just after they listed. Share price went on beautiful runs. So I never invest in IPOs, ever, 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 and I will never do it. So the rest of that is, yeah. Even the IPO, IPO process, investing process, uh, I, I sort of know where to start. In fact, I do get a few emails saying, oh, we have this opportunity to invest in, in this IPO. So you do have to go this, through this process, but I, I wouldn't know where to, not where to start. I wouldn't know where to start, but I'm not sure exactly what you need to do because I don't do it. Yeah, so it's an easy question. Lisa Edwards Cry playing in the background. I had detail at the IPO, sold it for a quick profit, missed out on 28 bagger. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, you know, um, we. I think to be a true investor, we all need stories like this. I have sold out way too early uh, a lot of companies, way, way too early. Just James Dean says, speaking of multi-baggers, how does one size their position? I think I've already told, talked about this. I talked about this in yesterday's video. I think it was, I, I think it was um, 10 baggers. And I think my answer was it depends on the company. Uh, For instance, if it was a high-quality company like Amazon, maybe not Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google or Alphabet, I think I would treat that differently than if it was like a a mining spec exploring company. I would be way more nervous holding a multi-bagger on that company than I would for a company that is high-quality that is continuing to grow. I think that's how I answered that. Uh, Rams Demand says E-Road is hovering around $1 on the New, New Zealand Stock Exchange, where exchange is leading the sentiment. I, yeah, took profits with E-Road. So let's have a look. This will be my last question of the day. So I have rules when it comes to my trades. So I have sell points. So this is me buying at $0.90. Cents and I sold at a dollar and about $0.02, cents, I think. So not Quite as high as it reached, because I reached about a dollar and thirty-six cents. But uh, so this little dash line is my sell, and I actually preempted the breakdown of E Road. So I sold probably about uh, the first of October, uh, and the whole reason I just thought, yeah, this is going to drop. This is going to continue to drop, and it just continued to drop. Uh, share price right now it's eighty-three and a half cents, so it's below what I bought. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what's happening with E-Road, and I'm not sure what's who or who is leading the sentiment. I would assume it's New Zealand because they opened first, uh, and it's a New Zealand company. I would assume that, but I could be wrong. But, yeah, this is, I think, a really good example of having rules in place or having a stop loss in place. Not an automatic stop loss, but I had a manual stop loss. I knew what price I wanted to sell, and this was a case where I slightly went against my rules. I preempted my stop loss. I sold before it hit it just because I just didn't like the chart. I didn't like the sentiment. 
I didn't like how they were selling. You just there was continual selling. Anyway, that's it for today's video. If you have any questions, any thoughts, leave it in the comment section of this particular video. Otherwise, I'm not a advisor. If you do need advice, make sure you seek out someone who's qualified and can speak to your own financial needs. That's it for this video. Have a good day. Bye.